a true spiritual person is somebody who knows that the only arbiter of whether I am okay or not okay is me. Sometimes you look at people and we're like, wow, they're around this crazy personality and they can navigate well. Why is that? And some of these people aren't even really spiritual that I see being able to do this well. I think what it comes down to is really knowing the self, appreciating themselves and saying, okay, I'm going to put this, I'm going to give it the right amount of space and energy that it requires. Welcome to the Spiritually Hungry Podcast, episode 67. All right, excited, excited, excited for this episode. I'm excited to spend some time with you. I mean, I'm me. excited to actually be feeling a little bit better this week after the surgery, whatnot. All right, so here is the question of the hour, or as you desire it, the half hour, <laughs> but I'm never going to commit to that. How do we maintain equilibrium in the midst of alarmists and emotionally fraught situations? In this episode, we will share some tips on how to stay centered and avoid being dragged into someone else's emotional turmoil. As I said, I'm excited, and I think partly because I'm really excited about this story that I'm going to lead us off with here. Okay. I know how you love I hope it have ha has a happy ending. Stories. Well, I didn't write this one. Right. I didn't write the other one either. But this is a famous story, so you probably did not um, read it in your childhood because I think yours was slightly different than most. It is the children's fable. It's a story of a chicken little. And it's also more aptly, I think, known as the sky is falling. Do you know that story? Yep. Okay. So it goes like this for those of you who don't know or don't remember. Do you think there's anybody of our listeners? I guess uh, I wouldn't. My mom. Yes. Say, never heard maybe. the story? Uh, I don't think she. Yeah, I don't think that she read this one to oh, me. Really? <laughs> so Chicken Little is outside. An acorn falls from a tree and strikes him on the head. He's startled and fearful. And he concludes that the sky is falling. So off he runs, shouting, and one after another, he meets all his friends and tells them the sky is falling. Now, this is my favorite part. Cocky Locky, Ducky Lucky, Goosey Lucy, and Foxy Loxy are all panicked. They decide they need to go warn the king. So off they go, telling more and more people along the way. And I remember actually when I was a kid reading the story, I was like, oh no. I was so worried that they were going to destroy, like what was going to happen? Chaos that this guy was going to fall? No, that these oh. idiots were actually going to believe that. <laughs> so this is interesting because this is where the stories diverge. In the modern interpretation of this tale, they find the king and he says, the sky is not falling. An acorn hit you on the head and everyone lives happily ever after. In the 1823 version, it ends with all of them being eaten by Foxy Loxy. The moral of the 1823 version was crystal clear. Panicking and believing everything you hear could literally get you killed. That's interesting. I think so. So the sky is falling has become synonymous with the hysterical... By the way, you're completely off topic, but well, you know, for that. it always bothered me with Little Red Riding Hood, did you kid, did you reading a children's story where a wolf eats the grandma. How about Hansel and Gretel? <laughs> All of them, yeah. Yeah, they were they were very dark. And actually, those, were ch those are versions that were changed. If you read the original ones, they're really even much darker. Miriam, our, our oldest daughter, took a class, I think it was her senior, senior year in high school, and she'd come home with the other version of the tales. And she's like, why'd you ever read? I said, I never read you that version. Um, yeah, very dark. So the sky is falling has become synonymous with hysterical or mistaken belief that disaster is imminent. And Chicken Little has become a byword for, for, for fear mongering. And I love this story because there's a lot of depth here. So the first question is, what is the first thing, and it's not going to be a school lesson, but what's the first thing that Chicken Little did? He got scared and he told all his friends. He needed other people to share his experience. He was fearful. And that's, I think, our natural tendency, especially when we feel negative about something and we feel scared about something, right? We want to, and we don't, I don't think for the most part, I'm talking about healthy people. I don't think they intentionally go and try to bring their family members or friends down the rabbit hole with them. But when we are afraid or we are desperate or we are sad, it's like, oh my God, I need to hold on to something or I need to have this kind of like, I need everybody to be here with me. And again, the reasons for it and the agenda, I think, is different. There's a myriad of reasons for that. And I think that most people would say that there are drama prone personalities in their lives. There's that famous SNL sketch that me and Miriam really like, Debbie Downer. <laughs> <laughs> That's one that will never go away because it's always relevant. But I think I think where we're going to go here today is um, why do we allow 
that space in our lives, right? Because it's a choice. You get to choose your environment. And um, and what are some of the tips and tools to avoid or remove those people from your lives? Of course, sometimes it's family members and you can't remove them, nor do you really want to, but it's really how to navigate it. And I think ultimately it's it's your consciousness about it and about how you spend your time and where you want to live your life. Absolutely. And, you know, scientifically, many of these ancient teachings find their way into modern science. And um, really, uh, the first mention of this, I think, is in, in by um, a philosopher and psychologist, James Baldwin. In I think he wrote it in 1897, if I'm not mistaken. He wrote about this concept that today is called emotional contagion. Oh, that my God! Get oh, out of gonna... my head! That was my next point. <laughs> well, so, okay, so I won't go too deep into no, it. No, no, go into it. I'll just banter with you. I love that. I love when we do that. Yeah, look so... at my paper, because emotions are contagious. Exactly. And uh, and science has proven that now. Yes. That when you are, even unconsciously, it's not simply if you sit with your relative and they tell you how terrible things are, but even if they're in a bad mood and you're completely unaware of it, you will pick up on that. And it will be as contagious as a cold, a flu, or COVID. Well, Psychology Today says, as a species, we are innately vulnerable to catching other people's emotions. Right. And by the way, they found that also uh, chickens, primates, and dogs also catch our emotions and catch the emotions of other animals. Well, it's called secondhand stress. Yes. Yeah, but but that, by the way, it's also true for the positive, right? Not just the negative. Correct. So I think if you begin with this truth, right, it's a fact that being around somebody or people that are in a negative state of mind will absolutely, almost always, I will say, because there are ways around it, I think that's really the point of today's podcast, will influence you. And sometimes you, you, you'll come out of a room, you spend a half hour with somebody, and suddenly you just feel down. Yeah, and you're like, what just happened? Yeah, and we, it's not that necessarily, right? There are those cases where it's obvious. They just told me about how terrible their lives are, how terrible the world is. But sometimes it's not even that. You just spoke about the weather, but you just feel drained. The reason will can be is that they are in a negative state of mind. And because of that, you caught that from them. Well, I do want to just bring some research here. They found sure. that depression in a spouse frequently leads to depression in a partner. The same holds true for roommates. In addition, children raised by depressed parents are significantly more likely to be diagnosed with depression. And I thought this was really, really interesting. There's a study of infants in the research center at University of Colorado that discovered children whose parents are experiencing high stress levels are more likely to develop asthma and autoantibodies that increase the risk of diabetes. Isn't that fascinating? Yes. Yes. Because at the end of the day, our most influential factors in determining our evolution, for better or worse, are really the people we surround ourselves with. Absolutely. And not just that, I think another element of this in, that, that we have to deal with in today's world is that the social networks, and you know now it's so much in the press, where it, they've known for quite some time that the, the negativity put forth by the billions of people on social networks, Facebook and, and this, the like, influence us. And interestingly, you know, I think it was around 2012, Cornell University and Facebook did a um, a study without letting people on fa- who were using Facebook know that they were in a study, mm-hmm. and to test this theory or this fact, this truth that the the information that's put in front of you, the people in their state, their emotional state put in front of you, will influence your emotional state. Interestingly, Facebook and Cornell got into trouble for not letting the people who were in the study knowing that they were actually in the study, and that, of course, leads into today's headlines. Well, I mean, even but, if you think about exposure therapy, right? When you're exposed to anything, it will influence you in one way or the other. And I think far too often people think that they are uh, more in control of what affects them. And unless you're really, really working on that every single minute of every day, um, things come to you. I mean, for me right now, I'm, in the, I'm home a lot. I'm working from home. I don't have a lot of mobility. And I think about this a lot. There is nothing right now, it's temporary, that comes into my space unless I choose it, right? I'm not walking on, I can't go walk on the street. There, there's a lot of things I cannot do and I'm not going to go into that right now. But normally on any given day, I run into or have conversations or exchanges or even pass by and you have a look from somebody from what, 30 people a day maybe? Um, some are invited, some are not. And of course that affects me. And and I said to this to you last night, like it's so interesting never being exhausted or never being like stressed in the last few weeks because I am very much choosing my environment very specifically because I need to heal. Uh, but we don't approach life like that normally. Right, right. So I think the first very clear 
understanding for all of our listeners is the fact that we are absolutely influenced by the emotional state of every single person who is around us, certainly those with whom we spend more time. And the question then, if therefore is, knowing that that is the case, what are the things that we can do? What is the consciousness, the thoughts, and the tools that we can use to not allow the negative state of those around us, and often even the negative state of the groups that are around us, to to influence us in a negative way? Well, I think, again, first is to be mindful of how interconnected we are and how much really people affect us. And I, I can give an example of kids. You know, we have a lot of, we have four and our, we have older ones. And I know that when, when my older kids might be in a mood or something's affecting them, I am affected, whether I want to be or not, it immediately, right? Then I'll notice it. I'm like, wait a second, this isn't about, and I'll be able to pull myself out. But it, it happens automatically, right? I've become very attuned to be able to identify it and then decide not to respond. But it's something that unless you really, really practice this, it just is an automatic response. Um, so I would say the first is really to focus your attention on what is important. Um, because if not, your your thoughts, everything's kind of hijacked. And I want to ask you about this. There is a letter that um, Ravash Lag said in it, or maybe it was an article, he said, as for me, I do not feel obligated to participate in this misery. And I think he was responding to somebody who asked him about his credentials in, in teaching Kabbalah or spreading the wisdom. And by that basically is that wherever that person or interviewer wanted to take him, he decided very clearly, I'm not going to go down there, right? So isn't it kind of just being more selective about what you choose to respond to. Absolutely. And I think it begins with a very important spiritual teaching, and that is that nobody should influence what I think of myself, what I experience other than me. Meaning, naturally, we live in a state where what other people think about me, say about me, influences whether I am okay with who I am. Right, even as children, right? So many children grow, of course, into adults that are seeking approval because they feel they never got approval from their parents. For example, a true spiritual person is somebody who knows that the only arbiter of whether I am okay or not okay is me. And of course, I would hope that the 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 way you we gauge that is how how much am I growing, how much am I changing, how much am I developing my altruism, my what we call our desire to share, right? Hopefully our framework is the right one. But once that is the case, the only reason I should be okay or not okay with what I am, who I am, what I'm doing, should be me. And the fact that you, well, you're my wife, right? But somebody else or, yeah, or, or, or our family member is unhappy with me or has something negative to say or is even in a negative state. I have to become strong enough pr- and practice this enough where it no longer influences me. But I want and, to challenge you for a second you know, because most people don't know what they believe. And when you don't know what your beliefs are, then your thoughts are in jeopardy because anybody can then hijack in. So you, what you just said is that you need to be able to know who you are and know what, not everybody knows that. But, right, so I think that that's the first place to start is to really ask yourself, do you know what you believe? Sure, sure. But I'm saying, but right. I mean, but that that's well. Maybe, you're saying that's a given. No, not a given. I'm saying that's work. That's very important work. And you know, I'm sure there are other podcasts where we spoke about that. But once we accept that, right, that that I need to know what I believe. I need to know what my desire is for myself, who I want to be, who I want to become, how I want to grow, and, and so what on. I want my experience of life to be. Exactly. And all that hopefully has a spiritual foundation and is is the best it can be at this point in my life. So basically, hopefully you've been hungry enough to this point to have gotten of course, to that. Of course, of course, of course. That that's that of course, if you don't have that, it's it's hard to na- take the next step. But once that is the case, once we come to some level, and hopefully it's evolving all the time, understanding who I am and what I believe and what I desire and where I want my life to go, what other people think about me, what other people feel, even speak about me, becomes less and less important. And ultimately, that's really who we want to be. We want to be a person who who holds themselves up to the, the correct standards, whatever we set for ourselves, but are completely uninterested in what other people are thinking about us, feeling about us, saying to us. And 
that is the first step. But if you if you if you don't start there, then of course you're 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 open to the you know to the to the winds of everybody else's emotions. Let me ask you, and I agree, obviously, hundred percent. But and I and I know somebody like this. She works for somebody who is very demanding and a little bit of a um, an emotional uh, terrorist, I'll say. And uh, and she works for her, right? So I think that often people become so especially if it's their boss, right? So part of their job is to anticipate the feelings, the desires, the needs of the person they're working for. But then you have to be careful not to empathize too much that you aren't if you get stuck in their feelings and you're not in tune with your own. I think to a certain extent, again, depending on the person, I think there are times, you know, as we know, there's time for everything. There's time for empathy and there are times when you should shut off, literally build a wall around yourself. And I know that I practice this very often in different situations. If I am coming in contact with somebody who I don't believe is in the in the and again, these are judgments we have to make in a state that I want to be connected to, right? They're depressed, they're unhappy, they're generally uh, a, a down person, and for a what Debbie, I, a downer. Debbie Downer, exactly. <laughs> My goal is because, assuming and certainly their family member, if there's somebody for what, for reasons uh, we have to be around, you have to build some form of protection around yourself, which doesn't mean that you don't converse, that you don't interact, but you are very clear about the fact that this is not somebody whose energy, whose emotional state I want to be caught by. By the way, I think you think about. Morton's Fork, right? Where you have two paths you can choose. Usually people think it's just two choices. For instance, in this case, either I I just put up with it and I build that wall, which most people wouldn't know how to do that in a way that's healthy. They'd probably just shut down and build a wall, which is not what you're saying. I think we'll unpack that a little bit more. Um, or they quit. And, and quitting is not really an option because this person might help them with their career and, and it would be smarter to stay professionally. So there's a third option, right? Which is to become a person where you're able to see who you are, appreciate your own gifts enough, have enough respect and appreciation for yourself to say, okay, I'm going to allow this person to influence me only professionally. And all this other chaos that I see, I'm just going to understand that it's not really real and it's their chaos and their illusion. And I think there's very few people that can do that. And that's why sometimes we look at people and we're like, wow, they're around this crazy personality and they can navigate well. Why is that? And some of these people aren't even really spiritual that I see being able to do this well. I think what it comes down to is really knowing the self, appreciating themselves and saying, okay, I'm going to put this I'm going to give it the right amount of space and energy that it requires. Unfortunately, we tend to respond overly strongly to the wrong kinds of things, especially the things that are are in our face, are explosive. You know, we all have people like that. I've had different people in my life, um, more uh, not by choice, I'd say, that really demand that. Like they go nuclear and then they explode on you, and and it and it takes a while to really learn how to navigate that. But it's completely possible. Absolutely, and necessary. It's necessary. necessary. Exactly. And, and I would say it's interesting because I remember a few years ago I was working with um, with a professional athlete that was on a very famous team, and they were going into the playoffs, and we were having these conversations. You know how, and as many of us know, uh, is in all areas of life, but even in professional sports. The emotional state, the consciousness state, for is, extreme athletes, you're for extreme, is, yeah. is as important as wow. physical preparation. Because I mean, you, you look at athletes. I mean, I think extreme um, when you're at an extreme level at any any state, right? Athlete, job, whatever. The mental is is more important than exactly. actually the uh, exactly because you can have the same person in the same physical state, but one of them is, at one point they are a strong mental. Uh, a state and the other time not, and they will perform completely differently. Yeah, very good. So, point. so as we were prepare, as as we were, again, they were going through playoffs, and and we were talking about this idea that I said, if there's one thing that you can think about, is think of yourself as a rock, right? That that strong, stable, unchangeable being that doesn't get pushed by the wind. And this is the same thing we're saying now: is that for all of us, is that when you are entering into a into a situation where, for whatever reason, you need to be there, but the person that you are interacting with, you know, is either a gaslighter, a negative person, a Debbie Downer, or really wants bad for you. I mean, there's oh, that also, too. That's all, absolutely, <laughs> or all of the above, sure. And it's not necessarily that they're bad, but they're in lack. I mean, that's the reality. Right. 
you have to enter with a different thought process. Not, you know, many of us are maybe naturally empathetic, and naturally we like, we, we desire to feel, and which is often important to feel other people's uh, pain. In some cases, not. In some cases, you have to shut that off. In some cases, you have to be a rock. You have to build that protection around yourself. So, it begins, as we said before, with clarity of yourself. And this is, again, I, this is a really a life's work, where we really come to a state where what is important to me is whether I feel that I am doing the right thing, whether I feel that I am living my life as I, is it as I am meant to, as it is the right for my soul to live it. And I care less what anybody else thinks, says, feels about the way I am living my life. If you have that, then you can come into interactions with the Debbie Downers of the world and the and the and the uh, Chicken Littles of the world and the family members that are in a negative state and not be swayed, moved, not catching the the negativity from them. The contagion. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Have you ever been caught up in an emotion or become fearful because other people were afraid and? What happened? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think it happens. You know, we have the blessing of, of, uh, of being around people all the time in different capacities, and being both spiritual, hopefully, and empathetic. You know, it's relatively easy to feel a person's emotion. I can walk into a room usually and know, okay, this person's happy, this person's disappointed, this person is, you know, lost. And just last week, I mean, I, I would say probably every, a few times a week, I'll be in a room with somebody, and I can tell that they're. In a negative space, that whatever it is, my and I and I'm conscious of it. And suddenly I say, "What's second? You know, I'm feeling something, right? Even before I, I can even pinpoint why. And then, and this happened last week, and I said, "Okay, that that's where he's at." Um, honey, where are the juicy details? The juicy details. Name you want names? <laughs> no, I don't want names. I just want. It's so generic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to protect the uh, the guilty. You can, but you can make the story a little more interesting. <laughs> Um, so there was a there was an occasion, somebody celebration. And I'm giving you Loxy Foxy and yes. Funky Monkey yes, yes. and Chicken Little. Yeah. And I, no, I'm no, getting no real people. I'm yet. like, I walked into a beige room and there was a person. Yes. So <laughs> I'm sorry that it's not as colorful as you would like it, but I do want to protect the guilty. So I was I was it was an important day for this person, and I was and it was important for them that I be there, and I could tell that their energy was off. So, and I didn't even, couldn't tell if it was directed towards me, if it was just directed about other, other, who knows, right? And 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 I immediately said to myself, you know what, this person's in that state. Doesn't matter to me. It doesn't. Not at this point. Um, and I will be positive, and I will be smiling, and I, not not acting. Or well, sometimes you should, even if you're not feeling, you should start acting in that way, so that hopefully that becomes your internal feeling, and you act that way. And. I don't know if it did or did not influence them, and honestly, it didn't really matter to me at that moment. What mattered to me is that my state of mind remains healthy. So, I would say, it happened to me last week, it happens to me a few times a week. When you're around people, I'll give you an example, another example, without mm -hmm. names. Again, in, in the morning, most mornings, I spend with our uh, community here in New York, we make our morning meditations, prayers, and connections. And sometimes, you walk into the room, and you can tell some people are really sleepy, some people are, you know, sort of woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Oh. Exactly. And, you know, I, I see it as actually, and this is also an important point, as almost my responsibility to always be the most positive, not the most positive, but a positive influence in the room. I love that. And I think... Well, that's why you come singing in if I'm because I was a little grumpy last week. With oh, wow, I should have used that example. And in the morning, Thank you're you like, la, 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 la. And almost, I was like a little bit because you were really overly animated. And like, I knew why you were doing it, but you've just articulated so clearly why you do that. Exactly. And I don't think I fully connected it until this moment. But you were like, zippity doo da. I mean, I don't like that song, but you were like that chipper. Yep. And I think that, uh, and I have noticed this as a theme in our relationship, if I'm if the if I'm da like the downer I am, the happier you are. And actually it's contagious. And then I'm like, okay, you know, I actually you know what happens? And then I look at you, I'm like, I actually want to feel like that. So I'm gonna just like I'm let go of this. And I so I which actually leads to a very important point, right? Related is that but though, by the way, I just want to say one thing yeah. I want to hear you say, but like yeah. walking into the room and the prayers and everybody's like low I love that your mentality is I'm gonna be the light in the room, or I'm going to be the the source. Um, but 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 you're also human. Don't you sometimes want to like? I guess sometimes you do. Maybe you're surprised. And everybody's super excited that morning, and you feed off that. Sure. I know you're saying you don't want to be dependent on it, but it can also be a little oh. bit 
Oh, absolutely. Boring that, or exhausting of time after time. Oh, of you course. Are, yeah, of course, of course. But but you know, there's always a give and take in life, and of course, there are times when you walk into a room and people are, are excited and you're excited as well. You know, but it, there's no there's no static uh, state. But but I think, and again, this is the point that those of us who understand our lives in I would say the spiritual context, which basically means that as a general rule, the purpose of my soul in this world is to bring light. What does that mean? Happiness, joy, blessings, not just to myself, maybe even most importantly to other people. And when you view it in that way, then you understand that your goal every single day, whatever room you walk into, whatever person you walk by, is to bring light. And light, again, to be clear, joy, happiness, a smile, energy, energy. energy. And to be, to be, you know, we always talk about the fact that we are meant to be the creator, right? The difference between being, you know, reactive or proactive, or being the creator, is the fact that to be the creator means that I am the one who's creating the energy in the room, mm-hmm. not anybody else who's in a negative state. And I think it's important that we really actively, actively, and I'll give you another example. There, there was a distant relative. And now, who's the storyteller today? Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we we actually had this conversation. So there's somebody who we both know, and I won't go, I don't want to name names. Who's a very like, you know, you, in life you meet many different people, and there are only a few that you meet that are really just always negative. I mean, wait, do you stay with this is a friend or a family? No, this is a, uh, not a family member of yours. <laughs> 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 uh, maybe I should have said that. Maybe we should edit that out. I'm not sure. We're not editing that out. No, I don't know. Okay, I'm not sure about that. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> in life, in life, you know, you often meet people who are only, often very happy. Sometimes you meet people who are often very negative. Some people in the middle, but there are very few people who you meet that are almost not almost always negative, right? And this person who who we're t- I'm speaking of is always negative, and. Mm-hmm. Every time I know that they're going to be around, I'm not even sure who you're talking about. That's, how, that's how much I don't see exactly negativity. Exactly. Every time I know they're going to be around, I literally go into this place of you know I'm just b- both excited to see what kind of negativity is going to come. No, you're totally entertained. Sort of entertained. Entertained. What's entertained, happening. entertained is the first thing, <laughs> and the second decision I I make is that I'm going to be so positive in this room. Huh. And uh, and I, this. Ha- know, why didn't you give me these cliff notes before? You know exactly what for you, but actually, yeah. like I like that. Like, let's take it to the next level. Yeah. I'm more like I'm going to be even, but this is a game changer. Yeah, yeah. I'll be entertained, and I'll be very, very. Well, I'm more always positive, entertained, but the, more the, positive than I'm usual. I'm going to be like, yeah, Mr. Bubbly, Mrs. Bubbly. Yeah. Do you want to ask me a question? I do. Uh, I actually was going to ask you that question, which is, you know, can you share a time that you were influenced in? I was going to say a negative way by other people's emotions or or words. Well, I feel like that was my whole life before um, Kabbalah, <laughs> but I do want to share something that was a shift for me this summer. So my mom had to go through a procedure, and when she was getting the news from the doctors of the different ways to go about it and different options, and of course, you know, as we found with finding my surgeon, you go through a whole process, right, of interviews and finding the surgeon who you're comfortable with, who has the the best experience, um, a bunch of factors. And we were abroad at the time. And so I had just enough space to hear her, but not to be brought into it, into her emotional state. And and rightfully so, it's a very emotional process that she was going through, I completely understand. But this was the first time, because we were traveling and, and reception was spotty in different places, she would get a response from a doctor. She'd have a really bad reaction to it really really bad and normally i'd be like but it's not making sense what you say and i'd be i would be, i'd be afraid that she would actually do the thing that she said she would do which was against what the doctors are suggesting because i had the space i could implement what i always wanted to do which was not take it seriously and i i thought about it i was like she's just having a reaction and even if it's with total respect i'm saying this immature or childish or having a tantrum, which we all need to have sometimes, right? She's having a reaction to something she needs to do and doesn't want to do. And normally I would just jump in on that and try to fix it. I was like, no, no, this is going to pass in 24 hours, maybe 48. And sure enough, 
I would wait that long and I'd be like, so, you know, did you decide whatever? Totally different person, totally different outlook. So I think very often, especially with the ones we love, we want to be there to support and to help and to save and to protect. And what happens very often is we get dragged down right. into their emotional turmoil because how could you not when it's that extreme, especially if the stakes are high? Sometimes they're not but especially when they are. So if we just, if we have the time, of course, sometimes we don't, but for the most part we do, we're able to remove ourselves and say, okay, you know, what will this look like? In a dare, I'm not gonna react at all. I'll hear, I'll even empathize, but completely not get emotional about it. It changes everything. Yeah, no, be and so that was a big thing for me. And I, I, think I, can, I think I can make it stick. Nice. There's one other element of this, which I think is important. And that is, so we've spoken about a few ways and 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 tools not to get swept up by other people's emotions. But I think it's important to ask the question, why am I experiencing this? Why is this person in my life? Why is this family member in my life, even if it's only occasionally? And the understanding is nothing is by coincidence. Every person and every situation that's in my life has a purpose. And for the most part, the purpose of these interactions and these people in our lives is to help us grow. So I think it's important to have that view, which therefore means that it's not just, okay, I'm in a situation I don't want to be in, what are the tools that I can use to get by or, or pass through in a more positive way this negative situation, this negative person? Really flip that thought, which is, no, if this is my relative, if this is the person who's in my life, or what, my boss, my, my co-worker, there's something that I am meant to grow and change. And at the core, I think it goes back to everything we've spoken till now. I am meant to become stronger in not being influenced by other people. So again, so when this happens next, rather than saying, oh, "Why is you know why am I around this person again? Why is my boss being so negative right now?" Say no. There's a reason why it's happening. Why they're doing it? That's their whatever you know their 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 movie. But I need it. I need this growth. And unless we are constantly challenged in this way. We won't become the strongest version of ourselves. We won't become that rock that we spoke of before. So I think it's important to, to embrace the negative people in our lives. Again, there are certain people who we can say, okay, this person is so negative all the time. I Maybe I'll excise them completely from my life if I can. Maybe I'll just see them once a year or twice a year. All those are important decisions to make. But those who, people who are in our lives, those, those, those negative people that we do come across, let's not view them as... A, the enemy. The enemy or just an unfortunate reality, but rather as an exciting opportunity. This person just said something really negative about the state of the world, for example, because I need to become stronger. And I'm going to use this opportunity to become stronger. And I'll actually, you asked me this another story, and I can, I can tell you the details, <laughs> although I do think I might have shared this in one of our previous podcasts, but I remember this is a few months ago, I was driving down the street, I was, I was in the left lane, and there was a truck in front of me, and it didn't have its brake lights or its hazard lights on, so I assumed it was just waiting for the light, and I'm standing there, and I'm in the car behind it. So, like, two minutes go by, and the, the lady behind, there's a lady in the car behind me, she honk, starts honking at me, and then she comes around, and she rolls down a window and starts yelling obscenities at, at me. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And then I realized that the truck in front of me was just completely off so he he wasn't he wasn't waiting for the light he was just stopped and i had stopped behind him and then she thought that i was being an idiot for not passing him or whatever so and i remember the first second i'm like you know i was like you know i, I don't know if the word is offended but like you know i was like hurt a little bit that she started cursing at me and i said to myself you don't know this person you are never going to see them again so what difference does it make that they think you're a complete idiot right because but unfortunately because of our ego we are we are naturally very sensitive to what people, complete strangers that we will never, ever see again, think about us. Certainly that is true about family members, certainly it's true about people who are in our lives. But what is the purpose of our life? The per part of, of our spiritual development is to get to a state where we every day care less and less, and not about, certainly about what strangers think about us, but certainly what even people in our lives think about us, because I am that rock. And I, I am the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong for me. And what other people feel, think, say matters less and less every day. But we need the challenges. We need those people in our lives. I needed that lady to to come around me and and curse at me because I needed to grow and become that much more of a rock, that much more confident and certain in my own 
decisions, life, as we said before. Yeah, I mean, I love that story too. You did say it before, um, because it's not just like most people go to dark places. Like, what did I do to deserve this? Did I piss that person off in a past life? <laughs> You're just like, I just needed to exercise this muscle of just really not caring. And I, you know, I love that. And it reminds me of a story I've actually never shared. I've told you. <clears throat> but it, it's so apropos um, because basically what you're talking about is our old friend negativity bias, which is we believe something negative faster than we believe something positive, right? right? Pretty woman, right? She she said it really well, Julie Roberts in that movie. We react more strongly to negative stimuli. We respond stronger to negative events versus positive ones. We're very vulnerable to negative information coming from others. And it takes less evidence and less people to convince us of something negative. And it's just crazy when you put it out there like that. Um, but I remember a few months ago, I had parked uh, our car, New York City streets, um, and it was a Friday. So I had parked uh, in a space and somebody else had parked in front of me. So I parked and by the time I went back to the car, it was Sunday. And I got there and I, I, I wish I had taken, I think I sent you pictures, I must have them somewhere. But the, not exaggerating, all over the front dashboard, the side windows, the mirrors, the doors, the hood were post-its, yellow post-its, paper that was taped from like a notepad, eight by 10, all over berating me. Now, I don't know who did it, they don't know me, and they're like, you are the worst driver, you are selfish, you are, do you think you're so important that you would take up two spaces? I mean, any scenario that they could imagine, like they judged beyond that I parked like that because I, whatever reason, in truth, there was a car in front of me and I parked where I could park based on the car in front of me and behind me. But when Sunday came, those cars weren't there. My car is only there. And so they assumed that I just parked like a jerk. And I remember as soon as I read this, first of all, I felt shame. I was like, oh my God, I gotta get these off my car right away. <laughs> Turned bright red. I and then I saw those post-its in my head flash before my eyes the entire week after. <laughs> now, why? And we were talking about this. I think I told you and the kids, and that was it. And I was like, it is so stupid that this bothers me. It is, and I don't even believe none of this is true. I know what I did, but the fact that it kept flashing before my eyes spontaneously throughout the day for an entire week just proves the unless you get a and like and and I'm happy it happens. I was like, I'm not again, I needed that to reconfirm and reestablish that I am not going to be that person that cares about a, a phantom. I don't even know who did it and they don't know me. Exactly. I think so I think you know what we're saying is that actually in the proper context embrace the Debbie Downers. Embrace but don't give them too much space. Of course, space not. I'll give them life. zeros. Give them no, I embrace really the the opportunity that it's presenting. Exactly. You don't embrace them and you certainly should not be at the receiving end of that. There's no reason. Right for enduring that over long periods of time. For sure. Do I have time for a joke? Yes, I love jokes. <laughs> so Especially this, off this Debbie Downer thing. Yes. So this lady goes to her hairdresser and uh, she sits down and uh, the hairdresser says, so any plans over the next few days? He said, yeah, actually me and my husband are going on vacation to Italy uh, right after I get out of here. He says, oh, that's interesting. Where are you going? Uh, sorry, what airline are you flying? Oh, we're flying Delta. And the hairdresser is like, Delta is the worst airline. They're always overbooked. The food is terrible. I can't believe you're going on Delta. Where are you staying? In where, where city are you going to? <laughs> so we're going to Rome. He says, Rome, I've been there. There's nothing to do there. I can't believe you're going to Rome. What hotel are you staying at? So well, we're staying at the uh, uh, par uh, Pantheon Hotel. He says, Pantheon Hotel, I stayed there once. It is the worst hotel in Rome. It smells and the rooms are old. I can't believe you're going there. Well, while you're in Rome, what are you planning on doing? He said, well, we wanted to go see into the Vatican and maybe see, you know, the Pope's uh, Mass. He says, what are you talking about? There's thousands of people there. You're going to be in the back and I'm going to see him. It's going to be a terrible experience. Anyway, he finishes his work. She gets out of the, 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 hair, the, the, the salon. She goes on her trip. She comes back three weeks later. She sits down in the, in the chair. And the, the hairdresser says, so, so how was your trip? He says, well, you're not going to believe it. We went Delta. And like you said, our flight was overbooked, so they had to put us in first class. Uh -huh. We were sitting in first class. We had an amazing meal, amazing wine. We land in Rome. We go to the uh, 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 Pantheon Hotel, and they just had just completed a complete remodel of the hotel. The ho rooms were brand new. They were beautiful. The best ex best hotel we've ever stayed in. He says, oh, that's interesting. What did you do there? He says, well, you know, like I told you, we went to to the Mass in, in St. Peter's uh, uh, Square, and as we were standing, you were right. We were all the way in the back. We couldn't see anything. 
And one of the Swiss guards came and tapped us on the soldier, soldier, so, shoulders and said, you know, every once in a while, the, the Pope likes to have a few common <laughs> people come to visit with him. So you've been chosen today. Come follow me. We go in a small door. And we go in and we have a private audience with the Pope. He says, wow. The hairdresser is quite impressed. He says, and he, she says to him, he says, you know what? He even asked me a personal question. And the hairdresser says, what was his question? He, so the Pope says, so he says, what did the Pope say? He says, who messed up your hair? <laughs> now you made me fake laugh yeah. this time. Take my laugh from the other <laughs> laugh. So I think to cover everything really um, is for our listeners to ask themselves, who is it you're choosing to spend your time with, your environment, who are you choosing to give energy to? And I think some very um, basic questions to ask to kind of remind yourself of everything we spoke about today is, do the people that you spend time with possess qualities that you wish to emulate? Does your social circle inspire you to be your best? Do the people around you live lives that light you up or make you ask for more out of yours? And conversely, do you find the people in your life to be in a constant state of drama? Do you have a friend that continually wants to gossip or is a friend group judgmental or unkind to others? And I think it's really about taking stock of the qualities of the people you choose to be around. Yes. And I would say, understand that the emotional state of the people that you interact with, whether you have to or choose to, absolutely influences you. And therefore, embrace the negative situations by knowing that you want to grow to become that rock that is uninfluenced, but that you need to be challenged in these ways by the negative emotional states, negative words of people around you, when it happens, not that you choose it, like you said, but when it happens, understand that it is purposeful. That the reason why I have to experience this person in this state now is because I need to become stronger, and I need to become an individual who cares less and less about what those around me feel in a negative way, and what, what those around me say, and behave in negative ways. And by the way, I think uh, to add to that, a big part is that you can feel another person's experience or pain and empathize with them even, but you do not have to go down that rabbit hole. You really can be able to see it and to feel it with, without ever becoming it. And, and it is possible, like the story I said yes. about the summer, where you just, you know, look at it, see it through a lens of like, everything is fixable, everything's a process, and how do I want to participate in this? Right. Right? And you have to practice, practice, practice. So we did get a letter, and actually, um, I want to read this one because uh, it inspired me a lot, and it made me really happy, actually, um, to hear this. So um, his name is Paul. I felt compelled to reach out after hearing how Monica dealt with her recent surgery. I really enjoy your podcast, and it's been a great way for me to connect on my commute to work each week. I was particularly taken by how Monica asks the creator to work through the surgeon prior to the procedure. I'm a physician who performs spine interventions in New York City, and I've been a student of Kabbalah for 20 years. I completed my fellowship in June, trained at very prestigious institutions, performed well over the required amount of procedures independently. I passed all of my board exams. However, before performing procedures, I often find myself overcome with self-doubt, fear, etc. I worry about hurting patients or not being able to resolve their pain. So first of all, I love that he's so conscious and aware. I, I, I hope that all doctors are this way. Or at least the ones that we <laughs> clever <laughs> yeah. have to meet. I often speak with mentors, colleagues, as they assure me that this is totally normal for someone in the early stages of his career. I have been spending a few moments each morning before clinic or procedures meditating. During this meditation, I visualize the 72 names of God and ask the Creator to work through me and guide my hands, mind, to help heal my patients. At first, I thought that asking for help somehow meant that I was a bad doctor, and that I should be purely reliant on my training, clinical acumen, and treatment guidelines to provide excellent care to my patients. I cannot tell you how refreshing it was to hear your perspective as a patient. I particularly appreciated how you pursued the provider whose ego did not come through within your interactions. As, phys as physicians, we're often so perceived to know everything that it often becomes depleting. 
particularly over the course of the pandemic. It's really nice to hear that patients ask the creator to act through their physicians while I am asking the creator to do the very same thing for me. Please feel free to pass along any additional thoughts about your experience. Thank you for doing what you do and providing a medium through which busy individuals can connect weekly. So that really, really moved me and made me so happy at the same time. Yes, really, really beautiful on many levels. And um, I'm sure that our listeners will be inspired by this letter as well. And again, really very Also, give me your card. I'll be passing it along. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you are looking, right, for any professional, certainly a doctor, you do want to make sure that to the degree it's possible, they are asking the light of the Creator to work through them. So, thanks to Paul and his inspiring email, we remind all of our listeners to share this podcast with as many people as possible so that they can be inspired as well. Go to Apple Podcasts, give five stars, write amazing reviews, of course, that are uh, your true feelings. Send all of your questions, comments, inspiring stories to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. These letters inspire us, and I am sure that they inspire the thousands of our listeners. So please make sure to continue to send them in to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. Stories, questions, inspirations. I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. Stay spiritually hungry. Bye.